Hello and welcome to Safety Glazing 1. So what's on deck for this class today? We'll talk about why safety glazing is required, what safety glazing is, methods of safety glazing, how it is identified, and then we'll get into the details of hazardous location number three. This is the third of eight locations listed in the IRC. And this one's related to glazing adjacent walking surfaces. There are a number of features in the built environment that can cause nearby glass to be more unsafe than usual, like stairways, hot tubs, ramps, or glazing used in guards. These are just a few examples where a human is more likely to impact the glass and thus the glass needs to provide a little more level of safety. Essentially, glass is hazardous and hazardous locations require safety glazing. This little clip from the ending of the movie Ghost gives an example of that hazard. The villain is about to see his fate when the, this glass is impacted and this large sharp piece is about to come down. This is what we're trying to avoid in locations where it's likely we're going to impact the glass. So what is safety glazing? Essentially, it's glass that is impact resistant or that breaks up into small pieces when impacted. There are test standards for safety glazing. One of them is from the Consumer Product Safety Commission with a category 1 or 2, and another test standard is from ANSI with a category A or B. This is an example of the test assembly created when glazing is tested for compliance and for meeting these standards. A hundred pound weight is anchored to this assembly and lifted to 18 inches for a class 1 or a class B glazing. These are the less uh, um, stringent test requirements. For the next class, class 2 or class A, the 100 pound weight is lifted to a height of 48 inches and then allowed to swing and impact the glass. This is a much more restrictive standard to pass. Tempered glass is the most common safety glazing that we see used for this reason. It's still sharp, it's still glass, and when it breaks it has sharp edges that can cut you. But the geometry and mass is not there, like what we saw in that video from the movie Ghost. That large piece of glass has enough mass to impact and hurt you, but the small pieces can, uh, cannot. The test requires that no larger than one square inch maximum size pieces are created upon impact if the glass is to break. Tempered glass does pass the standards for the more stringent testing, the 48 inch drop, so it is more impact resistant. This is an example of tempered glass. The rear window of most vehicles is tempered, and this was what happens when my friend's son, baseball, hit the back of his truck. It broke into a million small pieces, aren't able to hurt you. Another method of safety glazing is security film. These are proprietary products that are primarily marketed for window security to stop a window from breaking to prohibit the snatch and grab where someone breaks in and quickly unlocks your door. In these tests the window does break and it breaks into large dangerous pieces but the film keeps the window together and prohibits it from collapsing and hurting you. These products must comply with those IRC standards previously discussed. Let's go to Google and do a little search online to try to find one of these products and see how readily available the specifications are. We'll put in a few basic uh, keywords here like safety, glazing, um, security, windows, glass. Let's do that and see what we come up with. If we look on our list, it looks like the first link here is a product called Shatterguard. Let's try that. Let's wait for it to load and oh, there's an intro. We'll skip through this fancy intro and let's get to the meat. Let's look for something that's about smash and grab or security. Maybe over to the left. Here we go. Smash and grab. There, technical specifications. Let's look at this. Here's a list of specifications. Uh, here's physical properties. Let's scroll down and we're looking for the ANSI or the Consumer Product Safety Commission standards. Here they are. 
here we go. The ANSI standard, it says it has passed them. And for the consumer product safety standard, it's passed the category two. So we know that this product does meet the standards for safety glazing. But we've got to know that products are safety glazed. It's just clear glass unless there's some sort of identification. When evaluating glass, each pane of glass is evaluated and identified individually, not the entire window assembly, just each separate piece of glass. The glass has to have some sort of permanent um, identification, typically an etching, and one that can only be removed if destroyed, so that it can't be moved to another non-tempered piece of glass. The identification must state the type of safety glazing, like tempered, and it also must state the standard of safety glazing for which it complies. Let's look at this window assembly. Here we see three separate panes of glass, and each pane of glass is evaluated individually and labeled individually. Maybe only one of them is required to be tempered or safety glazed due to its proximity, whereas the other ones may not. This is a typical example of the etching found on tempered glass. And here we see what we need to know. It's tempered and it meets this standard and it's a category two. So we know it met the higher impact standard. This would be acceptable safety glazing. There are other ways to identify it, <coughs> like a label on the glass. For example, fireplaces, maybe near a bathtub, the face of the glass of a gas fireplace would have to be gl temp safety glazed but a big etching on it would not be very attractive for that type of feature. So a label could be applied to the glass, showing that it is tempered. The label can only be removed if it's destroyed upon removal. Another option would be a certificate or an affidavit or some other information to show the building official that indeed what is in place is safety glazing and meets the standards. This is not allowed for tempered glass, but for products like the security film, it is. So perhaps what we found in that Google search could be brought to the building official to approve the safety glazing method. Another situation may be that when building a deck, perhaps the existing glazing is already safety glazed. Like in this case, these windows are likely already tempered glass or safety glazed from their proximity to this door. That's another one of the hazardous locations, but we're not discussing that one today. So let's look at the hazardous location we are going to talk about, and let's get into those details. This is the third one listed in the IRC provision. All four conditions must be present. There are four separate conditions, and if any one of those conditions is not present, then the location is not considered a hazardous location. Let's go to a 3D example of this. Here we see these windows over to the right, and let's analyze them for safety glazing. The first condition is that the bottom of the glazing must be less than 18 inches above the walking surface. This is the most common one and probably a criteria that you've heard in the past, but it's only one of the four that are required for this hazardous location. The top of the glass must also be greater than 36 inches above the walking surface. The glass must be more than 9 square feet in area and the glass must be 36 inches or less horizontally from the walking surface. So for that glass that we looked at, safety glazing is required. Let's look at this pane of glass though. It's 36 inches or less horizontally and all the other conditions are the same as the other window. So indeed, this would have to be safety glazed. But let's look at this window. Now we're more than 36 inches horizontally from this side. And if we look from over here, we're also more than 36 inches horizontally. So in this example, this window assembly would only require the left pane to be safety glazed, whereas the right pane would not. At the edge of a deck may also be a time to carefully consider the design. This window, for example, if all other three criteria were met, it would be wise to hold the deck back more than 36 inches to keep at least one criteria from making that pane of glass require safety glazing. If we look back to this example, 
we can see another time that a simple design change could drop a hazardous location out and stop the window from having to be replaced or covered in a film. Perhaps that 18 inch distance from the bottom could be greater than 18 if we just drop the deck down. Like when we talked about the stairs that could come outside of the exterior door. Maybe if the deck was dropped just a few inches further that one criteria would fall out and this would not be a hazardous location. There are some exceptions to safety glazing to look at. The first one is decorative glazing and the second one is the installation of a protective rail in front of the window and it has its own particular requirements. This is stained glass, what we typically are calling it, but the code refers to this as decorative glass or doll glass. Essentially if it's made up of small individual pieces that are meant for artistic reasons then it is an, an exception from safety glazing. The IRC recognizes that it would not be feasible to have this type of artistic glass in a tempered or a, a f uh, covered in a film. Also the small pieces naturally mean that there's less mass and geometry to uh, inflict injury. The other exception is a protective bar. Here's that window that we previously found required safety glazing. If a bar is installed across the window, a rail, and it's between 34 and 38 inches high, we may be able to remove this hazardous location and the glass would not need to be safety glazed. However, the bar must also be able to support a 50 pound horizontal load per linear foot without contacting the glass. Now this is not one single 200 pound load that we're used to with handrails or guards. Rather, this is a 50 pound load at every foot along the length of the rail. Another criteria, the last one, is that the rail must be at least an inch and a half in cross-sectional height, like this. Not the height above the ground, but the height of the actual rail. With these in place, you are exempt from having safety glazing required at a, at a previously hazardous location. Let's look at one more example. Let's try analyzing this single pane in this window assembly. The first question is, is it 36 inches or less horizontally? Well, yes, it is. It's right next to the walking surface. Is it more than nine square feet? No. So one of the four criteria have fallen out. Is it l more than 36 inches to the top of the glazing? No. Looking at the rail to the side, it looks to be less than 36 a second criteria that does not apply. And finally, is it less than 18 inches to the bottom? And the answer here is also no. However, though all only one of the four criteria apply, indeed this piece of glass must be safety glazed. Why? Because it's not a normal walking surface. It's a ramp. And ramps are evaluated under a different hazardous location criteria. We'll talk about that in the class Safety Glazing 2. So let's look at some intent and purpose and wrap up this session. We've learned that glass located in hazardous locations where human impact is more likely must be safer than normal glass. There are standards that exist for testing various ways to achieve this, either tempered glass that breaks into small pieces or some type of film that holds the glass together and does not allow it to break apart. And finally, the method of safety glazing must be verifiable, either with identification, a label, or some other affidavit showing the test standards and that indeed it is safety glazing. My name is Glenn Mathewson and I thank you for learning with me today.